Hello, I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, creator of the Incandescent Radio Network, here with my friend and colleague, Tony Farmer, host of the Black Lives Matter radio show. We are thrilled you are here with us today, so let's get started. Hello, and welcome to the Black Lives Matter radio show. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, the founder of Incandescent and the producer of this fun show, wonderful show, important show that is hosted by Tony Farmer here with us today. Our guest on December 6, 2020 is Mr. James A. Samuel Jr., the founder and CEO of Pluribus Inc., a big data geospatial analytics company headquartered in McLean, Virginia. He founded Pluribus to lead the world in an entirely new industry, identity-based navigation. And he is gonna tell us what that is, why he feels that the world needs this new tech. And Tony, take it away. James, listen, uh, it's unfair to the listeners. It's unfair to hope because you and I are fast friends. You've been a mentor and a guide throughout my career and my entrepreneur endeavors. And I'm so pleased that you agreed to be on the show this evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll jump right in. Uh, first question for you is, uh, you have the distinction that not a lot of people have, uh, at least you know, not people in my circle. Uh, you are a former fighter pilot. Talk to us a little bit about uh, how that came about. Well, uh, Hope and Tony, thank you so much. Uh, it is a privilege and a pleasure to be with you this evening, uh, December 6th, 2020, of all years, right? Very auspicious uh, year in so many different ways. Uh, tough year, right? Very yeah, tough year for, for sure. the country, for the world. Uh, but I would be remiss. And, um, you know, if I did not start and level set the audience, you know, this whole session, by letting you know that uh, all praise, all honor and all glory for any success or anything good I'm about to say or anything positive that I may have done needs to be attributed above to uh, my father in heaven, uh, his son, Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit, my comforter and blessed seal of assurance. Amen. So that is my foundation, that's my rock, it's my pillar, it's my cornerstone, my keystone. It is any measure of success I've had is that's the source. So I want to make sure that everybody who hears the sound of my voice knows that first and foremost. Um, and again, thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for the platform and the opportunity to message uh, what I believe is really important, which we'll talk about uh, identity-based navigation, personal security and such. But to answer your question, Tony, uh, where do I, I've always wanted to fly. Uh, in fact, um, I'm wearing my class ring here from the Air Force Academy and inscribed inside um, you know, sign of the times when I graduated in 94 uh, are, are letters that stand for in a world full of people, only some want to fly. Isn't that crazy? And it's uh, the song from Seal, right? Crazy. Mm-hmm. In a world full of people, only some want to fly. Isn't that crazy? And uh, as a junior at the academy, uh, I marveled like, you know, I can't, why doesn't everyone want to bore holes in the sky uh, beyond the speed of sound? I just didn't understand how everyone in the world didn't want to do that. And so I had the great privilege and pleasure and honor to uh, protect and serve our nation, uh, boring holes in the sky in an F-15 God's jet, as it were, because it's undefeated in combat uh, at above the speed of sound. And I have lots of stories uh, over a cold one I'd be happy to tell you, but um, it's, uh, it's truly amazing. So tell me a little bit about some of the challenges you had uh, pursuing that endeavor. Wow. Uh, where do I begin? I started pursuing that endeavor. Um, I mean, as long as I can remember, I always wanted to fly. My dad was in the Air Force. And so I, I grew up on military bases around the world. I went to elementary school in England and junior high school in Las Vegas and high school in Mississippi and Alabama. So I, you know, as a kid, I, I had that kind of a global perspective on the world. So growing up on military bases, I remember growing up at Lake and Heath Air Force Base in England. And uh, at 354 uh, Brandon Street, which is our address there uh, across from Lake Eneath High School, we had plexiglass on the front windows of our house because the F-111s at the time before the F-15s got there, the F-111s when they take off, they would go through the speed of sound before they went out of sight. And so our windows would always shake. And you know, you're on the phone, you're talking to someone and everyone just knows you just stop talking because a loud plane is going by and you pick up your conversation right. where it left off, you know, and that's just, part of growing up on an Air Force base. So I grew up being reverberated by, by sonic booms, by, you know, the sound of freedom, by jet blast and thrust. I grew up smelling, you know, JP4, JP8, um, just being around airplanes. 
And then at one point I got a chance to smell like jet gas myself because I was strapping on the mighty Eagle and going to fly. So it's always been in my blood and uh, I decided to pursue it from an early age. And so the challenges are replete, not just the physical, not just the mental, not the emotional, not the technical, which are all immense, uh, but, but just uh, learning how to employ that aircraft and fight and, and maneuver where the margins are milliseconds and you know, just fractions of an inch, even at 450 knots at 20,000 feet. Uh, and knowing that what you do in any given moment will win or lose the fight. And it may not materialize for another 90 seconds or 120 seconds or so, but that fight was lost at a certain point. And then you just have to kind of play it out. There was no way to recover from that mistake and that error. And if you're fighting an equally or better uh, skilled opponent, they're gonna capitalize on that and you can't get it back. And so you just have to be aggressive. You have to be um, focused and just fierce and, and unstoppable. And, and so that mindset uh, has carried me, continues to carry me. Um, there's something about your personal background that I think is going to be important as I kind of move along in this conversation that I wanted you to share with Hope and our listeners. Uh, and it deals with uh, when you were in high school and, uh, you know, you mentioned that you spent time in Alabama, Mississippi, and what you did uh, in the way of trying to institute a prom there. Uh, tell us, tell us, give me a couple of snippets from that story as it relates to how you've used your platform to uh, enjoy the, the, the different backgrounds of people that you've encountered in, in your life. Yeah, Tony, thanks. Uh, that, that's a remarkable chapter. Uh, you know, this is the year 1989, 1990. And um, my dad's retired from uh, active duty Air Force service after 21 years and three months in the Air Force. And we retired back to my hometown in Alabama, a small town in Southeast Alabama uh, called Eufaula. And I arrived there as a junior um, and I had spent the first two years in Mississippi, Columbus Air Force Base where my dad was stationed, uh, Air Force ROTC. So I got to Eufaula, joined Army ROTC. And the first year I was there as a junior, someone walked up to me, classmate, you know, and I, I had sort of friendships with some of the kids along the ways because I had kind of come through the town, you know, fifth grade, when we came back from England, I spent some time there on the way to Las Vegas at Nellis, you know, and so on. So I had friendships and family ties there. So one of my friends said, Hey, man, uh, you know, which prom are you going to? And I'm like, well, is there more than one? And they're like, yeah, and there's a black prom and a white prom. And I was like, what? And it just didn't, I didn't process it. And I was like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And as I thought about it, I thought, well, that's pretty stupid. You know, I don't understand that. So I just, I just sat it out. You know, I didn't go my junior year of prom at all. And then my senior year, I was elected senior class president, student body president, and I was the commander of the ROTC battalion there. Um, and so, you know, I, I entreated, I, I went to the superintendent of schools. I went to the principal. I said, hey, you know, why do we have two proms? I've never heard of this before. I've lived all over the world. What's going on here? You know, somebody explained it to me. And what they said was, James, you know, you follow, you follow is just not ready for that. I'm like, okay, well, when will you be ready? Because, I mean, it's 1989, right? And, you know, 1965 happened a while ago, and 1865 happened 100 years before that, you know? And so I just didn't understand. I'm, what, 16, 17 years old. It wasn't the students, though. I mean, the students, we all got along. We liked each other, loved each other. We played in sports and, we wrote, you know, everything. The school was integrated, but the loophole was that the school said, well, we just don't have a school-sponsored social event. We don't have a school-sponsored dance. Uh, and to this day, today's the 6th of December, 2020, the movie theater in my hometown of Eufaula, Alabama is still boarded up. They, that movie theater was boarded up when my mom was a child there and they, they never reused that space. It's there on Main Street and growing up through high school, that movie theater is right there to this day. Last time I was there was about a year ago, it was still there boarded up because there will not be any, it's like, it's like, you know, what was that dance uh, show, you know, with uh, Kevin Bacon, uh, yeah, yeah. Movies, right? Like there yeah. won't be any dancing. There won't be any yeah. movies in this town. It was just like, <laughs> what? Yeah. And so it's still boarded up today, right? It's like, can't believe it. Um, so uh, on the side, I got my first speeding ticket while taking my sister to Dothan, Alabama and traveling 431 South, which was a speed trap. And we had to travel 46 miles to go see a movie in 1989. 
in a movie theater because our hometown boarded up our theater a uh, generation before I was born. So anyway, that was the setting, right? That was the town. And my exo, I'll give her, always give her credit for this, Ursula Juanita French, UJ French. I was lamenting this in uh, the back office of ROTC, junior ROTC there one day. I was like, you know, this is crazy. And I've gone to superintendent. I've gone to the, you know, I got Associated Press covered me. If you Google my name and you follow, you'll find the articles out there. You see me talking to Wayne Fickwood, the principal at the time. UJ said, well, we're the military and they can't tell us what to do. We should just have a ball. I looked there, I was like, UJ, you're a genius. I want you to plan that. <laughs> And so she did. And, uh, you know, she planned it. And we had the first school sponsored social event, which was uh, the military ball in 1990, because we couldn't get the, the proms integrated. So I went out to the Air Force Academy and I started there in 90 when I graduated. And then in 91, you follow had the first prom because they had the moral, they had the courage now uh, after seeing the example set by the military ball, which we had, that it was OK to have, you know, People dance together and hold hands and nobody got, you know, locked up or knocked up or whatever. It was just a good time. And so, right. Yeah, that that's I could talk all day about that. So so how did that propel you? Uh, how did that impact you moving forward? Because that's a pretty that's a pretty uh, uh, deep legacy to 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 leave behind you as a as a young man, you know, just before you're really embarking upon your life. Right. To to be that socially conscious at that age and to actually want to do something about it, right? Yeah, yeah, well, I'm sorry, what was the question again? Well, the question is, how did that impact you? How did that impact you moving forward? Just being able to uh, have that ball, you pulled it off, it happened. Uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, there's a lot of details and a lot of challenges you had along the way, but how did that impact you moving forward, moving beyond that? Well, I learned a lot, Tony. Uh, I mean, that was a very, impressionable time and an impressionable event, right? As you can imagine, I'm 16, 15 turning 16 when I first am exposed to this. And then I'm 16 turning, I graduated at 17. So I'm about 16 years old while I'm leading this, you know, and that's, if you, you know, you listen to President Obama or any other, you know, great leader, and they'll tell you that it's always that generation that, that leads uh, best, who's, you know, undaunted and, and fearless and doesn't maybe know enough to know to be afraid and just goes headlong. And I, I guess I resembled that at the time. I was just like, this is crazy. We should just do, we should just change it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. We should just change that. Well, right. well, let's just change let's, it. Let's just do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Right. <laughs> How hard can it be? And so, uh, but I learned a lot about uh, people and I learned a lot about change and leading change in that time uh, because you know, there was this change cycle that you probably have seen, you know, and I, I was talking to some foreign allies at one point, like, oh, that's the grieving cycle. And, you know, in our country, we call it the, the death cycle, you know, and it, it shows when you first are introduced to change and how you physically, physiologically, psychologically, emotionally, just, you know, it's like Newton's, one of Newton's laws, third law, maybe about uh, inertia set in. You, a body at rest remains at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. A body in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. And people who've been at rest or have the inertia of 400 years of legacy are just stuck. Yeah. And when you introduce this obvious need for change to them, it's not obvious to them. And they, there's a lot of change that has to happen at different levels and layers of their persona, their moral courage, their relationships what they've said they stood for. I mean, it challenges a lot of things. And so I learned early on how to recognize those things and see that change happening in them and read their face and their, their, their words and, and know where they were and wrestling. And when I saw that when Lynn Putz introduced me to the change cycle, a former mentor of mine, I was like, that's it. And it, and it really systematized, you know, what I was able to observe and I already worked through in different time ways. Okay, so now I can recognize where they are in that cycle and help move them and what they're dealing with. So that that impacted me greatly being able, there was a, a baptism in, in leading change and social change. And that was very impressionable. I got, I got a lot of letters, I got a lot of mail, right? And I called out of class to interview with Providence, Rhode Island or you know, uh, Eugene, Oregon, these different places are reading about it in AP. And uh, I got some hate mail too, right? You know, people saying, hey, James, uh, one letter I basically remember. I threw away a lot of them. And one of them, my mom's like, you should keep that. And I was like, why? It's so stupid. She goes, just keep it. Trust me. I'm glad I did. 
but it, it said, dear James, you know, why do um, black people always insist on pushing themselves on white people? I am white and I certainly like being with my own kind. Stop being an agitator, shut up and dance with your own kind. And it was signed white. And I don't know if that was Mrs. White or Mr. White, but it was just, <laughs> right? You don't know what the level of representation was. You just know white. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, that's your last name, you know, or right. 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 I'm, I'm, give, I'm, I'm give me some context. If you want to send me hate mail, give me some context, right? Yeah, you know, put your return <laughs> address on it, right? You know, man up, right? Or you know, whatever. Yeah. So I, I just didn't, I, I didn't, I kept it. I'm glad I did. Um, because I that that letter, though, it taught me a lot too, that, that mail, that response. There's a book uh, by Yuval uh, Harari right now. Uh, it's a New York Times bestseller. It's called Sapiens. And uh, that book kind of cracks the code. With that person expressing that letter, which was a lot of truth, that person was being very honest and, and very forthright in exactly what they were feeling. And they, they expressed it, you know, and they had the courage to send me a letter. And, and in many ways, I should thank them for that because I learned so much from them about people and intentions and, you know, and comfort, right? And what, how do we feel comfortable? There was a, a person who spoke at Gardner's training class about EEO and diversity, and he got on stage and he had a really thick Asian accent. And I don't know, Tony, if you remember this guy, and, he, and, he, and then he, he knocked off the Asian accent and then went into his, you know, just speaking, you know, not, not so cartoonish or stereotypical um, to make a point that um, our levels of comfort really are, are multifaceted and we are truly most comfortable around people who are most like us because, you know, anthropologically and, and you know, we, we don't feel threatened. Yeah. Um, and we don't feel like we're, we're a standout or an outcast or something goes down, we're going to be the one tossed off the island. And so when you look at diversity and inclusion there, you know, he spoke a lot of truth about that. We could talk about that all day. But anyway, I learned through that letter that first time about who feels comfortable and why and around whom and when. And so full circle, um, the technology that I'm building now actually takes into account that universal truth about human comfort and your settings and how to be most comfortable in different settings. So the gentleman you're talking about is Dr. Steve Robbins, uh, who will be a guest on our show uh, in a couple of weeks. So uh, thanks for giving a shout out to him. But um, <laughs> he, yes, he's you're welcome, Steve Robbins. <laughs> so the other thing I'll ask you before we jump into the software, which is uh, you have to tell the story of kind of, you know, the impetus of that, you know, you were with your family and uh, and, and there was a, a sudden occurrence to you mentally. But before we, before we jump into that, just one more question uh, about military service, because I know your service to, to this country means a lot to you. Uh, and it's difficult for people who grew up in different you know, neighborhoods and different cu cultures and backgrounds to understand that for some of us, we are Americans, we are patriots, and we don't see ourselves as anything other than, than that, right? I, my dad was career military, and there was a safe space on the base because everybody was from everywhere. And you had this cone of understanding on the base. There were just some, it, it was just base life and barracks life. Uh, so uh, I have this concept, right? My dad was what uh, one might call a ground and pounder, and uh, he was infantry. And uh, I have this concept of <clears throat> the academies, right? Uh, the Naval Academy and the you know, West Point and uh, Virginia Military Institute and the Air Force Academy. And this concept that I have in my head is, you know, white, 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 white. <laughs> so, so as a proud graduate of the Air Force Academy, um, tell us, you know, what your impression was when you first walked in and how that was different or the same when you when you left. Well, um, you know, it's it's complex and, and complicated. Um, I don't remember if it was W.E.B. Du Bois or if it was Carter G. Woodson. I have to go back. Um, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois, the souls of black folk and then Carter G. Woodson, the, the miseducation of the Negro. Um, two seminal works, you know, to understand black culture in, in America. But uh, one of them said, you know, as African-Americans, as black men and women, as Negroes in the time, you know, the lexicon of the time, we have to be bisocial. And I hadn't heard that term before. I was like, wow, 
bisocial, you know, not, not bilingual, not biracial, bisocial. It's like, whoa, that, there's, that's really deep truth because we, we have to learn how to navigate in different worlds that we occupy given all the rules and, and of the system, right? And if you read Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, I mean, oh my God, it's just brilliantly lays all that out. And in her other book before that, The Warmth of Other Suns, about the, the, um, the, the migration of African-Americans out of Jim Crow South from 1910 to 1970 or so. Um, that bisocial skill set that, that people in a minority class in America, it's African-Americans, it's Asian-Americans, it's you know, anybody who's in a minority class in America and other countries, it's the same thing, you have to be bisocial. And going into the Air Force Academy in 1990 and graduated in 1994, praise be to God, <laughs> um, you know, I had grown up as a base kid, like you explained. I had grown up on military bases. I was in this little cocoon, you know, this little protective environment that had its own set of rules. And we were also very diverse. And, and that was my world view until my dad retired in 1988. And I moved back to my hometown. And I had two years of then reality set in outside of that bubble before I went back into the bubble at the academy. And so my two years out of that military bubble, and, and it's a wonderful place to be. It's, it's very, you know, structured and, and it's great, um, safe in many, many, many ways. Uh, still a microcosm of the United States, not perfect, but um, a lot different than, than outside the military construct. And so I had two years outside and then I went back in. And so when I got to the academy, you know, I, the last two years, which I just told you about was like, oh, my God. Is that how it is outside the military? Is that, did I miss growing up? Did I just miss all that? Right. And I did a lot. And so getting in the academy, I felt really good. I was like, wow, I'm back. Whew, thank you, Jesus. All right. I'm back into, you know, this construct that I know and right. it's safe and it's structured and, you know, and all values and, and courage and discipline and, you know, and uh, codes of conduct and, and all that stuff. Right. UCMJ, you know, accountability. Oh, my God. Um, so uniform code of military justice for those who mm -hmm. are tracking the, the lingo there. Uh, so, yeah, and then it, it felt good. It felt really good to get back into that. And then to graduate out and to go into the Air Force, it just felt like home. It felt really good. Um, so that's that's what I got for you there. Awesome. Awesome. So now I'm going to uh, dig into your passion. This endeavor to, to not only be an entrepreneur, but to bring something really revolutionary um, to uh, the technological space, right? And, and to bring something that is life-changing and, and in many cases could be life-saving uh, devices that uh, are, are going to be very important moving forward. Uh, I want you to tell us about Angel. And if it's uh, okay with you, I want you to talk to me about uh, how this started. You know, you were traveling with your family and, you know, it, it became the impetus of Angel. So please tell us the story and then tell us about Angel. Uh, so it was November 2017. And uh, my family, my wife and uh, my two small kids, um, two boys, two beautiful, brilliant brown boys, um, were in a rental car in Atlanta. And we were leaving Atlanta, driving to Huntsville, Alabama to go visit my mother-in-law, Granny. And so we put the kids in and they were three and one at the time and get them all locked into their car seats and everything. We take off driving, put in the navigation system, you know, Granny's house and we take off and, you know, enjoying the road. We had flown in from DC to, you know, Atlanta and my sister lives there. So my mom was celebrating her 70th birthday at the time. So we did that and then we were leaving there to go visit Granny and then, you know, making the rounds, the family rounds, as it were. We take off driving and we get about halfway into the trip. The kids are asleep. So it's great. My wife and I are enjoying just our, you know, each other and the company and the road and it's a beautiful day. And, um, and we get, you know, kind of about halfway into the trip and we're like, wait a second. And we were so lost in the conversation we were having and just enjoying the, the, our, you know, our conversation, enjoying each other. And then we realized, wait a second, where, where are we? We started seeing, you know, a lot of signs and flags and things that told us that we maybe weren't safe that we should question our safety. We should question, you know, our, our whereabouts. Wait, wait a second, where are we? And I looked down to the navigation system and realized that we, it had taken us a very straight and direct route between Atlanta, Georgia and Huntsville, Alabama. 
And all at once I had like this, just, I was just kind of pissed at myself because I'm like, why didn't I just study the route? My God, if I had just looked at a map myself, you know, I know how to do route analysis. I can't even tell you how many different ways at, at what speeds and what altitudes and what weather conditions and what ATC clearances and all this stuff, right? If I had just done the math myself, I would have gone through Chattanooga. I'm like, oh, nope, I'm, I'm taking a dog leg. I'm going to go out of my way, but I am going through Chattanooga to get to Huntsville. Then I'll drop down into Alabama after going through Tennessee. And, and if there's a PBS special, uh, it's called Driving While Black that just came out earlier this year. And they talk about, you know, these, these books back in the uh, Jim Crow era, you know, the Green Book and, the, you know, and whatnot by Victor Hugo Green, which is why it's called the Green Book is his last name, right? And so, you know, knowing those rules, knowing how to navigate in areas where your safety can be jeopardized is a skill set that African-Americans in particular have really honed over 401 years in this country. And so, um, so I had the skill set. I just didn't employ it because I was trusting the technology. And so, anyway, I said to my wife, "You know, this is this is BS. You know, there's no reason this thing shouldn't have known that we were black." <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm, like, right. <laughs> I'm just like beside myself. It's the 21st century, and this thing doesn't know not right. to tell me to go this way. What? Didn't it scan me? Didn't it see my face? <laughs> what the hell is <laughs> going on here? <laughs> I was just mad, like at myself for not having just looked at it myself. And I was mad at the technology. I'm like, the information's available. Right. So many different ways. Why didn't it just, it should have known. Why doesn't this exist? And so I said to my wife, we need our own, you know, we need our ways that, that knows this about us. Mm -hmm. And that's when it, it clicked for me. Like, because I said to my wife, like, you know, I've hit a deer before because I'm from Alabama. So, I, you know, that's not that everybody from Alabama has hit a deer, but I have. And there's plenty of them. So I've hit a deer, drive my brother's car once in rural Alabama. So I was like, if I hit a deer, if, you know, somebody blocks the road, if the car breaks down, if the sun goes down, the sundown laws, there were laws all over this country about, you know, that they were, they were meant to keep us as African-Americans from gathering and assembling. They thought we were you know, from slavery days, we were just running, we were getting away from, you know, the plantation. So there's these laws, right? So if the sun goes down, which is another law, just in my cultural memory, like, you know, we, we could have a problem here. And so I was like, this is not good. So I decided to design a technology um, that navigates any person on this planet. And for that matter, a machine, right? Because it's not just limited to people, it's humans and machines, machine kind is the next, next uh, horizon. But humankind for now, machine kind soon, it should take into account all of our characteristics when helping us move from point A to point B. All of our characteristics. And we are so multidimensional, not just the hue of our skin or the, the amount of melanin, um, but our social emotional makeup. If we have olfactory sensitivity or you know, sight sensitivity or hearing sensitivity, um, if we are emotion sickness, if we are left-handed versus right-handed, there's so many things about us that if we're a wine aficionado or cigarette cigar aficionado, you know, if I'm going from point A to point B, I might want to know, hey man, there's there's a great distillery right here, and you should you should stop here on the way. It's it's on the way, and hey, you got little kids in the back, and they're this age. Here are the stops that you should make. Here here's about the length their bladder is going to really. So you know, knowing they're going to need to stop in 45 minutes, here's the gas stop that's going to best suit you with the cleanest bathrooms, and you know, and they have vegan food because your wife has a vegan diet. Whatever you know, right, right. There's so many different ways that our identity should be factored in when we're traveling and navigating through space and time as humans and soon machines that I said, I'm just going to make this thing. And so, um, right. Maybe that's a, that 16 year old hubris of this. We should just do this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm still glad. You, I'm glad. So glad you still have that. Yeah. You know, maybe it wasn't my age, maybe it was just something else, but I was like, yes. well, it doesn't exist. Let's just make it. <laughs> so, um, so I, we started making that, that technology our ways, and we're still making it, uh, and it's going to change the world in so many ways. We have a provisional patent for it. In fact, we just fought for our utility patent, so we're protecting the intellectual property, you know, that undergirds it. But there was a feature. So my wife and I, because uh, we love movies, mm -hmm. we, so, you know, my, my bride, right? This is, 
this is her, right? Dr. Evelyn T. Sam, that's my wife right there, author, coach, advisor, dentist. Uh, she's an amazing woman, just an amazing woman. I'm, I'm, I'm married way up, uh, out of my league, and uh, I just need to, I should have said that earlier. <laughs> so, <laughs> Believe me, I understand. You're right? I, I, I too married up. I got upgraded for sure. Man, big time. So uh, we were watching a movie. We were, we were watching um, Queen and Slim mm, earlier this yes. year. It was like yes. January this year. We were watching mm -hmm. Queen and Slim. This is before COVID, right? And so we were watching that movie. And I remember saying to my wife, like, you know what? We're going to build a feature inside of our ways. Because this was 2017, right? I didn't incorporate Pluribus until 2019. And there was a series of books, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Kiyosaki's books that actually changed my mind to, to actually mm -hmm. do this. And so um, I said, we should put a feature inside of our way such that if you get pulled over while you're navigating more smartly, but let's say you just get pulled over or something happens, this thing should automatically come on and know that you're being pulled over, right? So that's part of the technology that I won't tell you about because I'd have to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it would know that you're being pulled over and say, hey, um, boom, start recording and let your family know where you are and capture that moment and whatnot. And we should call it angel because as Psalm 91 says, he shall give his angels charge over you and keep you in all of your ways. They shall, you know, bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. And so if you look at our, our branding, it says that over the reticle, you know, he, and he shall give his angels charge over you because it comes from Psalm 91. And so that's why it's called, and we put a J in it just for vanity's sake, because my name is James, but that's where the name angel came from. But when Mike, or Mike Brown, I was in, I was in St. Louis for Mike Brown. Uh, I was living mm -hmm. in St. Louis in, in August 2014 when, when that happened in Ferguson. Yeah. Um, so that's why that name is right there. I was actually at his funeral. I was at my church. My wife and I were there. And I marched in Ferguson for what it's worth. But uh, when George Floyd happened on May 25th, 2020, something changed in me. Something shifted. Broke maybe is too strong a term, but there was a, there was a change that happened inside of me. Those eight minutes and 46 seconds, he was on the ground and calling for his dead mother at the end to save him as he was asphyxiated on the ground changed me. Because like I said earlier, I have two brown, beautiful, brilliant sons. And when I saw that happen, it, it changed me. And uh, it reminds me watching that eight minutes and 46 seconds reminded me of um, a song written by a Jewish American man in New York uh, called Strange. Um, it was called it, Strange Fruit is what it became known as. It was called something else prior to that. I can't remember what it is right now. But when Nina Simone covered that song um, and um, the last word in that song is crop. For those who don't know, it, said, it goes, southern trees bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root, black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees, pastoral scenes of the gallant south, them big bulging eyes, that twisted mouth, scent of magnolia clean and fresh, then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is a fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather and the wind to suck, for the sun to rot and the trees to drop. Here is a strange and bitter crop. And that last word of crop says it all about a byproduct of our nation. One of the things America produces out of all of the brilliant and wonderful things we produce to include hope and optimism, we also produce this crop, this commodity mm -hmm. called black bodies, dead black people. And for what it's worth, nowhere else in the world does the term black even apply, but in America. Mm -hmm. You thought you go anywhere else in the world and you say that person's not black, they're Nigerian. Right. That person's not black, they're you know, they're from Ghana. Right. In America, there's black and there's white. That's yes. an American construct. And so uh, that is a uniquely American construct. 
So that word crop and watching George Floyd get asphyxiated. Um, so angel is designed to make your friends and family and your loved ones aware of where you are if and when you start running into problems, whether it's someone who feels entitled that you shouldn't be in their space because though you're a student at Yale and you fell asleep in the dorm room writing your paper or whatnot, they challenge your need, your, your ability to be in, that you actually are a student at Yale. It's like happened to that young lady. My nephew's actually a student at Yale now. Or whether, you know, I mean, just name it, right? While black, mm -hmm. driving, yeah. eating ice cream, bird watching, jogging, I mean, get into your own house if you're a professor at Harvard. I mean, come on. And there's so many instances of this. So Angel is designed to document this and let your family know where you are and immediately notify them. If you think about Trayvon Martin uh, or Mike Brown or Elijah McClain or Ahmaud Arbery, um, these young men, for that matter, Emmett Till, I mean, they were going to the convenience store in their neighborhood and they were going home or they were jogging, right? Or they were in their neighborhood. They mm -hmm. went to get Skittles or whatever, you know, straight line was. And they're walking home and they were um, stalked, uh, preyed upon, asphyxiated in different ways, shot by people who thought that they had a right to take their life. And had their family known you know, Elijah McLean, I mean, God, that young man in Aurora, he's just like, you know, begging for his life and talking about what a pacifist he was and how he, you know, he doesn't even hurt insects as he's being accosted by, you know, these law enforcement officers. And it isn't always law enforcement officers, right? Ahmaud Arbery was jogging and, you know, right. and some, some do-gooders in the neighborhood or whatever. Um, you know, if, if you get an angel notification that your child is undergoing this type of treatment and you know that they're right around the corner from you, and this thing is, is in the case of Trayvon, you know, this thing is, hey, somebody's following me and I'm right around the corner and, you know, you're, you're going to get there. Yeah. You're yeah. going to be there before you can blink and that will change everything. And so we are intent on making sure people know where their loved ones are, if and when something's happening to them and provide them a route and a distance and a time to get to them and collect the, the evidence of the, it, the incident as it's occurring in real time and stream it and allow them to see it. So they can, they'll know, they'll have complete essay on the way in route to their loved one. Um, we're, we're trying to reduce the crop and prevent these acts um, and to let people know that there's, there's accountability that will ensue. There is a, there's a response, there's a reaction for every action. There's an equal and opposite reaction. There's, there's a reaction. James, you said something that I wanna go back to, um, particularly because um, Hope being a, a, the wonderful business partner and a personal friend that she is, uh, gave me a challenge uh, just last evening and she said, Tony, where do you see this going? Where do you want this to go? How do you think that the Black Lives Matter radio show is going to improve society, improve relations between the races and, and the different cultures, uh, cultures of people? And it really challenged me, right? It really, it really challenged me to process that deeply. And she coached me to it, uh, coached me through it. You know, uh, she is a Martha Beck coach and, and going through that process. Uh, and it was really enlightening. And you said something that really hit at the heart of the matter of why it's so important for the James Samuels of the world to have a voice, to have a medium to amplify that voice and to have advocates who are supportive of his mission. Here's why. Here's what I find fascinating. Here's, here's, America is such a fascinating and deeply complex place you know, with its, with its baggage. The Green Book, Green Book, the movie, won Oscars. It won Oscars. And what's fascinating is there's a good number of people who don't, who have no idea who Victor Hugo Green was and what his book was designed to do. 
the movie itself was focused on characters, eight characters, and these were real characters, by the way. I don't want to take anything away from the performances of the uh, the actors in that movie or the importance of that movie. But what was lost on why they called the movie The Green Book. And basically, The Green Book was a document that Victor Hugo Green, along with his wife, put together so that African-American Negro travelers would know where they could go to eat, where they could go, they could go to get gas, where they, they, they could go to lodge, because it was a segregated nation at the time. This was a document that helped you navigate through a Jim Crow, racially divided nation at the time. And though those things didn't impact us here in the East as much, it is fascinating to me that you had some, some life experiences in the South and you were traveling from Atlanta through Mississippi to, and it hit you, oh my goodness, right? Um, this fighter pilot, this veteran, this educated person, this person who, who dedicated his life to doing the right thing and, and following the rules and the depth of what it must have hit emotionally to go, oh my goodness, I can't believe I missed it. I can't believe that I, I did not calculate this in a way that ensures safety. And if there was a message that I wanted to communicate to people who may not understand why Hope and I do this, it's this. It is that in the year 2020, I don't feel safe. <laughs> right? I don't feel safe. And how do we get to a society where James and Tony, two upstanding patriots, Americans who seek to do the right thing all the time by all people, feel safe? And how do we ensure that Black parents, aunts, uncles don't lose their, lose their lo loved ones because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, so to speak, right? So uh, I, I can't thank you enough for uh, the friendship that you and I have forged. I can't thank you enough for the mentorship you provided. I can't thank you enough for giving me energy and giving me purpose in this space. Um, I want to ask you to say a little bit about how the Tuskegee Airmen impacted your life and your career. A little bit about the Tuskegee Airmen. A little bit. Man, God, Tony. Uh, you know, I feel like I need to react to a couple of things you said first. Uh, one, we were traveling from Georgia to Alabama. We were not in Mississippi at the time. Um, but it does remind me of a song that Nina Simone, uh, whose real name is Eunice Wayman, by the way. Uh, Nina is her stage name, uh, Nina Simone. Um, just like, hey, do you know who James Cleveland Owens is? Know who James Cleveland is. <laughs> yeah. James Cleveland Owens, his stage names, and I'll come back to the Tuskegee Airmen. And, uh, but James Cleveland Owens uh, was uh, documented by uh, Isabel Wilkerson in her book, The Warmth of Other Sons, uh, for which I think she won a Pulitzer. Um, and this young man was from um, Oakville, Alabama, which is close to Huntsville, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And his parents aspired to leave the Jim Crow South and travel to Cleveland. So much so that they named their son, James Cleveland Owens. And uh, they finally got there. He was nine years old when they finally trekked out of the South to Cleveland, you know, to get out of Jim Crow South. And uh, he gets there and, you know, he goes by JC because it's James Cleveland. And so his teachers are like, you know, what's your name, son? And JC. And she goes, okay, got it. Jesse, Jesse Owens, you sit over here. And uh, his name is James Cleveland Owens. Wow. Yeah. I just, wow. Like, Fascinating. You got to read this book, man. Warmth of Other Sons and then Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Phenomenal books. But anyway, the, the Tuskegee Airmen. So I went to, you know, from Alabama, as you know, uh, I was recruited by Tuskegee. And in some ways, I, you know, I, I talked to one of my mentors, uh, Colonel Roosevelt Lewis, uh, who was a pivotal, seminal character and person at Tuskegee. He is the favorite son of the Tuskegee Airmen. He's still alive, I still talk to him. Amazing man. Um, <clears throat> he got in his personal airplane at Tuskegee and flew to my hometown of Eufaula, Alabama. 
and presented me with the appointment to the Air Force Academy in my honors assembly program. Wow. And they got wow. back in his plane and flew back to Tuskegee and went back to work um, because he thought that much of me. And I am humbled by that because in the course of him recruiting me to go to Tuskegee um, to be in their Air Force ROTC program there. And I just, I, you know, I just didn't know my history. I, I didn't, I didn't know enough about Tuskegee at the time. I don't, I don't know if my life or calculus would have been different if I had gone to the academy or not, but I wish I had just known. Um, I got to meet Chief Alfred Anderson. And Chief Alfred Anderson was the chief flight instructor for the Tuskegee Airmen. And he's the one who flew uh, Eleanor Roosevelt in the backseat of his Piper Cub uh, over Moton Field. Um, and I got to meet that man when I was in high school. He walked me around the campus. And oh my God, what if I could have learned to fly from him who taught Chappie James how to fly and Benjamin O. Davis Jr. how to fly and Wendell Oliver Pruitt how to fly and Spanky Roberts how to fly. It, what if he could have taught me how to fly too? Oh, I just, uh, I don't have many regrets in my life, but I think about like, what if I had just known who was recruiting me at the time? And I just had no idea. And that saddens me because I missed what could have been such a tremendous opportunity and a linkage to such history and, and bravery. So that's, that's the first linkage I have to the airmen. Um, and I still have it. And, uh, you know, the, in, in uh, our federal agency, I named a conference room after them uh, mm -hmm. in honor of them and their history and their legacy, the Wendell Oliver Pruitt Tuskegee Airmen Conference Room. And, you know, I got to meet uh, many of them over the years. Uh, you know, I was, here's one, this, this one sticks out. I was driving um, back to the St. Louis airport with, um, with Colonel Carter, Colonel Herbert Carter. And he had come to speak in St. Louis where I was working and I had the privilege of driving him back to the St. Louis airport. And on the drive back, and I'm a former F-15 pilot, black pilot at the time. And I said to him, Colonel Carter, um, having experienced, you know, my own version of racism in flying, you know, being, I mean, hen's teeth there, that's how many black F-15 pilots there are, you know, hen's teeth, very, very few. And so I said, could, could you guys have done what you did you know, if you were integrated. And he said, no. He said, after the war, when we integrated and we went into all these different units, we dropped like flies. Mm -hmm. He said, they ran us out. He said, you have these majors who had a hundred, you know, combat missions and bronze and silver stars, flying crosses and flown in P-39 Aero Cobras and P-40, you know, Warhawks and P-51s and all these different platforms. And now they're a major and they, they integrate into these units after the after World War II. And then you have a lieutenant or a captain, a junior officer who's now the flight lead because they're they're white. And they just denigrated our us and just picked on in any given flight, there's a million things that go on. And you can pick one and just make it the world of it, checked in late on the frequency, or you know, your landing light wasn't on when you taxi or whatever. And they would just berate us and leave the door closed, but yell loud enough just shame us. And we just drop like flies. He said, we were integrated. We drop like flies. Wow. And he said, it was because we were together that we could use our own cultural paradigms to teach each other that perfect sight picture. When you want to rejoin, all you got to do is, you know, put the plane and the canopy pole and freeze it there. And that'll put you on the collision, you know, a cata and you can rejoin and you look for these sight pictures and in aviation, there's all this, just like in golf or anything else, race car driving, whatever, there's this secret knowledge. Yeah. And it's not in the books. You learn it on the rain days, the hangar talk. You learn it at the op mm -hmm. you know, It's past. If somebody wants to tell you how to succeed, they will tell you, this is what yeah. you got to do. For sure. And if they want to withhold that from you, then you just won't succeed because you don't have that secret knowledge that's passed from person to person. And in uh, and, and flying, it's the same thing. And so he said, because we were all together, we, we passed that secret knowledge to each other. We learned it, we figured out, and we passed it. And that, and that, was one of the great keys to our success. But when we were integrated, we dropped like flies. Well, well, I know um, I was, I, you know, I was picking on you a little bit because I know how much the that group means to you and and the personal and historical connections. Um, at this juncture of our show, uh, I always like to save enough space for Hope to ask a question and for her to, you know, offer any commentary uh, to and from our guests. So. 
Uh, she gets the last word. <laughs> uh, so Hope, over to you. Thank you so much. Wow, James, just blow, you blew me away. You know, this, what you've done, your amazing career and um, your big heart and your desire to help and save and educate others, you know, just, I, I wish you only the very best. And I hope that Incandescent can help raise the, the your voice and, and really have everyone know about you. I think my, my big question to you is, so tell us timeline, how we can learn more about your technology and when it will be available for public consumption. Thank you, Hope. Um, I'm really, again, like I said earlier in the show, it's a privilege and an honor. I really appreciate you guys giving me this platform, inviting me on your show to, to have this voice. Um, I, I did a poor job as a CEO, right? I did not promote the product. I did not, you know, make the sale. I didn't tell you the website even, you know, you, people have to hang all, all through this whole show to get to this point. So uh, the team, I lead, you know, like I, I let you guys down in that regard. I should have started, you know, as I saying, you know, www.angel.tech, A-N-J-E-L dot tech, T-E-C-H. That's where you can go. That's our website. Go to www. Or you can just put in your browser, angel.tech, A-N-J-E-L dot tech, t as in technology. And that'll take you to our website, our landing page. And you can see there that uh, you can download the app in the app store now. So we have, we're, we're up in iOS as of the 14th of October, we launched in, uh, in the Apple app store. So go there if you're an iOS user, if you're an Android user, it's coming. Um, we are in the final stretches of getting approval for, from Google to host our uh, technology angel in um, the Google Play Store. And so if you go to our website, angel.tech, you can click on the black button that says download here in the app store or the other black button that says click here to be notified if you're an Android user. And then you put in your email address on our other page and then we will keep you apprised as the, the development and then when it releases. Um, but it's, it's you know, days, maybe weeks away. We're really close. I, I, it'd be great if it happened in this month. I'm, I'm really hopeful we're working every day with my developers to make that happen. Uh, but that's where that's how you can get it and then it's a uh, subscription based program so you know it's a data plan and so you'll pay a monthly subscription to join and have this thing at the ready with you all the time we're in a global pandemic called COVID, right we know this we're in a dueling joint 400 year old pandemic called systemic racism and racial terror we also know this let's talk about the analogs right the parallels there's ppe we all know what that means now right personal protective equipment to fight one pandemic. Angel is PPE to fight the other one. It's personal protective equipment. It's a personal security system, right? There's a vaccine that's coming along. Um, you know, we, we go through all of these measures to fight in one way a pandemic, but there are these other things that we need tools and Angel's a tool to help us fight this other pandemic, which is systemic and institutional uh, racism and racial terror in particular, uh, not to mention just um, um, entitlement. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how you can find it. That's what it does. That's why, um, I, I have so many other things I can say about it, but that's, I don't know. I'll just leave it there. Well, it's beautiful. Um, that you've created this product. I'm trying to figure out how to say this appropriately, but I, I just, I'm so sad that it needs to be created, <laughs> that we're a society that harms and shames. Uh, another one of my clients um, is has pulled us on her team to help stomp out domestic abuse. Uh, Tracy Schott, she did a film, she's a filmmaker in Pennsylvania called Finding Jen's Voice and Incandescent is going to come on board and help her um, make sure that no man ever picks up a hand, a gun or a baseball bat or a harsh, horrible word to a woman, right? So that's on one side of it. And I think um, women can join arms in that. And it's hard to argue with it. For this, um, you know, that letter Hope, that you got. Hope, I'm sorry, before you move on, what is the name of that? It's Finding Jen's Voice. Finding Jen's Voice, yes, at Voices for Change. Voices okay. for Change. Four, um, number four, yes, remarkable. Um, yeah, I, I I'm gonna look them up. It could definitely be of assistance in this circumstance, right? So there are, yeah. there are, if I can interject, Hope, I'm so sorry. No. There are. We have, we're starting with protecting and saving black lives and really working for black moms to change their existence. And, you know, but domestic abuse, elder abuse, trafficking, teen violence, 
all of these other things are part of our future LGBTQ rights. Oh my God, I've already been working with HRC uh, endorsing us, right? All of these other things Angel can be used for. We, we started it because of who we are and where we are, but we understand and we hope that the world will adopt it for all these other uses. There, there are, I'll tell you, um, there's a domestic violence setting that I'm planning for Angel. Man, I would love to tell you, but I'll tell you offline because there's intellectual property that I don't want to just throw out there. Uh, but it, it will, um, it's, a, it's amazing. So let's talk offline about that, but yes. Absolutely. And I, you know, so to finish up our show tonight, I'm glad that someone like you is out there advocating for those who can't advocate for themselves. And I pray that someday we come to a point where that is absolutely not necessary anymore. Thank you, James. It was really an honor and a privilege to meet you and to have you on Black Lives Matter radio show on the Incandescent Radio Network. Yeah, um, James, I'll just close out by saying that uh, you know how I feel about you. You know how I am dedicated to your success, particularly in this arena. And I'm looking forward to all of the wonderful things that your technology will do for our society, not the, which, not the least of which is hopefully joining us and removing some barriers uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, Hope and I carry that, that dream uh, between us, and, and it's something that uh, we consider in everything we do. Um, but uh, what's, what's most important is my belief that your technology will save lives. And, and I know as a, uh, a serviceman, a veteran, uh, a man uh, of God, uh, a man who has a conscious, um, a deeply moral and ethical man, uh, that is at the height of your motivation for, for this technology. And uh, it, that life could be my own uh, and my own children. So I am deeply invested in your success and I cannot thank you enough uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, and we hope to have you back at some point, you know, uh, maybe once uh, Angel is fully deployed and you start working in these other areas, uh, you will consider coming back and giving us some more time. So that, that's my last word. Um, hope over to you. Okay. Well, again, thank you, James Samuel with Angel dot tech a-n-g-e-l dot tech and no worries we will put this all over the liner notes so it'll be the first thing that people say with a link to your technology so and thank you so much mr tony farmer my favorite (laughs) co-host you are listening to the black lives matter radio show on the incandescent radio network we will be back to you next sunday evening 6 p.m eastern standard time uh and i'm in las cruces new mexico four o'clock here so we will be in touch be well stay safe and we'll talk to you soon So that's all for today's episode of the Black Lives Matter radio show on incandescentradio.com. We have an amazing lineup of future guests, just like you heard on today's show. So be sure to tune in for another episode and tell your friends about us so they can listen too. If you or someone you know should be a guest on our show, send me an email, hopecatsgibbs at gmail.com, and we'll be in touch. Again, this is blacklivesmatterradioshow.com on the Incandescent Radio Network. We look forward to talking to you. Until then, stay safe and be well.